Words are great, aren't they? I mean, each word means something different, or at least in an ideal world it would. I mean, don't even get me started on homophones, homonyms and homographs. And that's coming from someone who's definitely pro-homo. Take a few words and put them together and you have basic instructions, warnings or descriptions. Take a dozen or so and you have the art that is haiku. Around 90,000 or so will get you a novel. And yes, I did Google what is the average length of a novel. And well, beyond that, the sky really is the limit. Words can be descriptive. They can be perfunctory. They can be fun. And they can be a whole lot of other things in between. But they can also be boring, tiresome and confusing. And unless you are a legal eagle, you should totally check out his channel, by the way, link below, or you're a real policy wonk, the chances are that you steer clear of the impenetrable, bewildering and frankly labyrinthine tombs of text as used by the legal profession and politicians. So when, a couple of weeks or so ago, the House of Representatives passed the $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill landing on the President's desk where it was signed yesterday, there was much confusion over what exactly was in it for existing and prospective owners of electric vehicles. Given that the US legislative branch is also working on a second totally separate bill, called the Build Back Better Bill, that also proposes amazing things for plug-in car owners, things have gotten pretty confuzzled. And no, I'm not talking about the furry convention that happens every spring in Birmingham, however good it is. I'm talking about complete, utter confusion over what's now about to become law, what's still on the table, and what happens next. Before we get any further though, have you clicked that subscribe button yet? Or hit the bell? I know it doesn't make a dinging sound, but it will tell you when our next video goes live. And let me tell you, we have some pretty great videos coming. And if you'd like to help the channel grow and give our new video editor hire a long-term job, please consider becoming a Patreon. If everyone who watches this channel gave just $1 a month, we'd be able to do all the things. That's the equivalent of about two Starbucks lattes a year, or if you prefer, uh, three or two and a half gallons of petrol at current US prices. To the video. I know that on a recent roundup show, we covered the breaking news that the infrastructure bill had passed and we tagged it onto the end of a discussion of the Build Back Better EV tax credits. And I know that didn't help with the confusion. So yeah, in the future, we'll try and do better. And yes, I know we are covering politics and I know a lot of you tune out when we cover politics, but just know that in this case, if you are pro EV or pro cleaner transportation, this is something you're gonna wanna know about. And hopefully listening to me talk about it is a whole lot easier than just reading the bill. As I've already noted, there are two distinct bills that have been grabbing a lot of attention in the media recently. Bills that, at first, contain the majority of the things that President Biden and Vice President Harris ran on during their election campaign. Initially, this included everything from free preschool and college education to funds for improving the US rail network, rebuilding the electrical grid and repairing roads and bridges. While the original price tag was far higher than the 1.2 trillion US dollar bill signed into law, which I should note had bipartisan support as well as bipartisan opposition, 13 Republicans voted for the bill and six Democrats voted against it, much of the core of the infrastructure bill actually remains. Oh, and by the way, while military budgets are often expressed in a cost over n numbers of years, this bill's price tag is just listed as being $1.2 trillion, which might cause you to think it's more expensive than your average military or otherwise spending bill, until you realise that this is for $1.2 trillion that it's expected to be spent over the next 10 years. But before you get too excited, know that the infrastructure bill won't be changing yet how much money you'll be able to claim back in federal tax credits, assuming your tax liability is large enough for buying an electric car. But I'll come to incentives in a bit. First, the infrastructure bill does include $110 billion for roads and bridges, $66 billion for railroads, and $65 billion for the power grid. For those concerned with the impact our climate has on the world around us, 
That's pretty great news. The US road system, especially bridges, has been heavily neglected in recent years and considering many of the bridges currently in use are now technically past their original design lifespan, having been installed when the US interstates were being constructed, they're more than due for an upgrade. But how does this help EVs? Well, smoother roads means lower rolling resistance and less friction, which means more efficient travel. How about railroads then? Well, unlike many other countries in the world where railways are the lifeblood for both freight and passenger services, railways in the US are severely underutilized and the passenger rail network is extremely limited, particularly as you move away from the Northeast. Investment in railways will help pave the way for more electrified rail services, faster rail services and fewer delays for the services we have today. Having experienced the rail service firsthand in both Europe and Japan, I would frankly love to travel more by electric train in the US, but right now our rail system isn't up to scratch. And if you're curious as to what rail travel is like, check out the excellent video that Alec from Technology Connections did on the subject a month or two back. Again, I'll link to it below. While this investment won't directly affect EV drivers, it will help reduce the overall transportation pollution emitted by the US, and more electric train services, freight or passenger will dramatically improve air quality and reliability of said services. Which brings me to the electrical grid. As many of us have experienced, the US electrical grid is not as reliable as it once was, and with more extreme weather events forecast into our future, we should expect to see more and more brownouts. Some folk, of course, will have you believe that the brownouts are being caused by electric cars overloading the grid, or that all those folks with solar panels on their roofs are making it harder for utility companies to do their job. The reality, though, is that the electrical grid in large parts of the US hasn't been upgraded all that much since it was first installed a hundred years ago. Add to that the fact that today's modern homes are using more electricity than they did 50 years ago, because gadgets use the juice despite improvements in energy efficiency, and we have a perfect storm. Incidentally, though, the reason EVs don't contribute to the problems the grid has today is because they're usually charged at night when the electrical grid is at its lowest demand. That said, a massive investment in electrical grid upgrades will make it easier to have more rapid charging stations on major roads. It will make it easier for vehicle to grid storage systems, easier for micro generation projects, and easier for grid tied megawatt hour or larger static battery systems to take off. And yes, that has been a problem. Here in Oregon, our local utility company has reached its maximum theoretical load for many areas because of an explosion in home building. When we had our solar panels put on our home, the electricity company had to come and survey the area to make sure the grid could take the extra power because it's old and it needs an upgrade. In addition to money for power grid upgrades, which will make it easier for renewables to be deployed and to set up clean power for the next generation, the federal government also wants to make the grid more resilient to natural disasters and more resilient to things like cyber hacking. Again, a cleaner, safer, more stable grid is good news for EV owners. But enough of the associated stuff. I mean, I'm not even going to go into things like the $25 billion for airports because doesn't seem to address the need for air travel to go zero emission, so let's leave that and instead look at the direct, tangible EV benefits of the infrastructure bill. The infrastructure bill sets aside seven and a half billion US dollars for electric vehicle charging stations, both lower power destination style charging stations as well as DC rapid charging stations. The way that the money is allocated will likely be as it has in the past. Companies will probably have to apply to receive some of the funding. But what's important here is that the bill will be quite specific about what infrastructure can be funded. And you can bet your late great aunt's secret recipe for corned beef hash that there will be no proprietary or closed standard networks allowed. This, again, adds credence to our theory from earlier this month as so eloquently set out by Winter, that Tesla essentially could switch to the now widely adopted CCS Type 1 connector for both its North American cars and its North American superchargers. And if you haven't watched that video, <laughs> I will of course link to it below. 
The funding also aims to ensure a nationwide rollout of EV charging stations, meaning that a company in California or New York won't be able to hog all the cash, while companies looking to set up more robust rural networks in states like Minnesota will be forced to scrape the bottom of the funding barrel. The federal government sets aside $7.5 billion to help electrify school buses, with an emphasis on electrifying school bus routes in low-income rural and tribal communities. These communities have traditionally suffered disinvestment and historically are the communities who suffer the most social, health and economic impacts of anthropogenic climate change. I'm going to leave the infrastructure bill there, but there is a whole lot more included. I'm just not mentioning it because those things are less directly connected to electric vehicles. So let's end by talking about the Build Back Better bill, the bill which is likely to be pushed through the houses using budget reconciliation, something I'm not going to explain here, but which I will link to an excellent video below that gives you more info than I can. The bill, which is still very much being dragged through the legislature, includes a proposed change to the incentives available to those who purchase an electric car. It's the one that's got Tesla, Toyota and some other automakers upset, and it's one which could make Tesla and Chevrolet electric cars once again eligible for EV tax credits. In a nutshell, the EV portion of the Build Back Better bill, as it stands today, proposes up to $12,500 US dollars in incentives for eligible electric vehicles, which, as the bill stands right now, remember, it's not been voted on yet by either the House or the Senate, but might actually get through the House this week, would be a point of sale incentive rather than a tax credit. It would also remove the current 200,000 vehicle per manufacturer cap of the current EV tax incentive program for EVs. This means that automakers who had previously exceeded that figure, namely Tesla and Chevrolet, would yet again become eligible for at least some of the funds on offer. A 12 and a half grand effective discount on the price of a new EV sounds great, but sadly there is some more nuance that is there, and that nuance is what has gotten people upset. That's because the total amount you're eligible for will depend on your income level as well as the type of vehicle you buy, as well as where it was made, where the components for that vehicle came from, and who actually assembled it. The revised incentive structure starts with a flat $7,500 point of sale incentive, which effectively replaces the current $7,500 tax rebate. That would be available for every new electric vehicle with a battery pack larger than 40 kilowatt hours. Those with smaller battery packs will only get $4,000 of incentives, which I'd argue could discourage more affordable, everyday EVs from being made. That said, those vehicles with smaller battery packs are, right now, generally compliance cars like the Mazda MX-30, so yeah. If your new EV features a battery pack that contains at least 50% of US-made components, which can include the battery cells themselves, you'll gain access to another $500 of incentives, raising the total funds you can get to $8,000. But the really controversial proposal, the one that's got everyone from Toyota to Tesla and even Senator Joe Manchin from West Virginia in a tizzy, is the additional $4,500 available for EVs that were made in the US at a production facility using a unionized workforce. This means that many EVs, including the Ford Mustang Mark E, which is made in Mexico, every Tesla in the US, which is made at non-union facilities there, and some companies like Honda, which currently don't make any EVs but are planning to shortly and may not use unions, are not eligible. While EVs like the Chevrolet Bolt and Bolt EUV, the upcoming Cadillac Lyric and Hummer EV, and the Ford F-150 Lightning will all be eligible for that extra cash. And when you're looking at a new vehicle purchase, a four and a half thousand dollar difference is gonna be enough to sway your purchase decisions. Toyota, Tesla, Honda, and others have all criticized the proposal. And although it's unclear right now if the bill will get through both houses in its current form, it's got people upset. If it does though, and the automakers who stand to benefit from it don't change their prices, we could be looking at cars like the Chevrolet Bolt EV starting from an effective price of just under $20,000, maybe even lower in US states that have their own EV incentive programs, 
while other models will be significantly more expensive. And yes, while several of the team here at the channel have belonged to unions and have our own feelings about the benefits of collective bargaining rights and legal protections, we've also grown to understand that not all unions are created equally, and not all automaker unions are as interested in worker protections as unions in other industries. Just like not every automaker or CEO or company is the same, not every union is the same. There are good ones and there are bad ones. Let's just leave it at that. Back to the incentives. In addition to the funds available per vehicle, there are also some limits on who can apply, as well as MSRP limits. First, if you have an adjusted gross income of more than 400,000 US dollars per year and are an individual, or you're joint filing and have a total income of $800,000, you'll no longer be able to apply for the incentive. Or to put it more bluntly, if you bring home more in six weeks than most Americans do in a year, you really do not need government subsidies to buy you your next EV. Next, there are limits to the overall sticker price for vehicles. Sedans must be priced at under $55,000 to be eligible for incentives. So no Tesla Model S, Porsche Taycans or Lucid Airs. And SUVs must be under $69,000, which means some Tesla Model Y variants just fly under the limit, but larger, more powerful and expensive EVs do not. For electric panel vans, the maximum price is listed at being under $54,000, meaning the Ford e-Transit will qualify. And frankly, I can't think of any other electric vans in mass production in the US right now, so presume that this limit was set with Ford in mind. Meanwhile, for pickup trucks, we're looking at a maximum sticker price of under $74,000, which third theoretically mean that some pickups like the Ford F-150 Lightning, Tesla Cybertruck and Rivian R1T in certain trims will be capable of applying, while others will not. To finish, I should note that this proposed incentive will run for five years as I've described and then shift sometime in 2027 to only be applicable for electric vehicles made in the US. After that date, if you're buying an EV that's made outside the US, it won't be eligible. Which brings me to the elephant in the room, price hikes as a consequence of new incentives. Right now, it's generally accepted that Ford is holding on to final pricing for its F-150 Lightning because it's waiting for that Build Back Better bill to get passed. And Tesla is rumoured to have already raised prices in anticipation of the same. And that brings me to a very uncomfortable conversation about automakers and incentives, and if they're really going to benefit from these packages more than the people wanting to buy the darn DVs in the first place. But frankly, I don't think this video is the place to discuss that. So what do we have? Well, we know the infrastructure bill's been signed, but when it comes to the bill back better, it's still very unknown. The bill in its entirety could pass without any issue, or it could go through numerous revisions on its way to becoming law. If you're looking at buying a new Tesla or Chevy right now though, it is best to expect that you won't benefit from anything yet and look on passing of the bill back better as a nice bonus if things go your way but you most certainly shouldn't be counting any metaphorical chickens as you make a purchase decision today because, well, the amount of money being talked about could make a big difference to your final sticker price. And if you disagree, you are probably one of the folk who doesn't need the incentive anyway. As always then, it's a matter of watching this space. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to this channel and our other channel, Transport Evolve Take 2, and especially now that we're not making videos every day, go on and hit that bell so you're told when our next video goes live. Thanks on behalf of the entire TE crew. Go out to the folks on my right for being our $15 to $49 a month Patreons. Special thanks to our $50 a month patrons. That's Joseph Broucher, David Danakula, Andrew Martin, Greta Trahota, Brophy Wolf, Michael Goad, Tazla in the Gong, Sean Ueda, Gordon C, Raging Fellows, Anonymous Freak, Jim Burness, Carl Hodgson, Anthony Coates, Ricky Leon, Brian Newton, Laura Sanborn, Roy Litwin, and Denny Hyde. And our deepest gratitude to our $100 a month Patreon supporters. John Lyons, Marcel Ward, Reggie Watts, Joe Brenzi, JP Fagerback, Will Graylin, Matthew Drobnak, Christopher Lee Jones, Paul Conway, Ellery Hennersley, and Ian. 
If you are feeling left out, then you can join Patreon at the link below, or you can show us our support through Bitcoin, Kofi, and our cool swag store. There are links for those as well. Our new video editor, Michael, joins us on December 1st. And while we are super excited to have him on the team, we could frankly have your help to make sure that he does more than just have a short-term job and to make sure he can eat every month. From just one dollar a month, you can support the channel. And as the saying goes, many hands really does make light work. Thanks for joining me. And as always, keep evolving. Bye.